reading this morning comes from John, 17th chapter, beginning at the first verse. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave to do, me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the word you have given, gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those you have given me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. The word of the Lord. May God bless to us the reading of this holy word. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight. Amen. It's interesting that in this prayer that fills all of chapter 17, Jesus prays for oneness among his followers. Interesting concerning, considering that it is yet centuries before the schism between the Eastern Orthodox churches in Rome as well as the Protestant Reformation, which will trigger countless divisions within the body of Christ. But undoubtedly, he recognizes the propensity for conflict and division between people, and the risk it poses to the mission he calls his followers to. For this reason, it is important that we understand what is meant by the idea of one. In the prayer, he says, so that they may be one, as we are one. The latter part of that refers to the oneness between Jesus Christ and God, which can be taken in a metaphysical sense, as in the three-in-one nature of the Trinity, but I think it's better understood in the sense of spirit, that is, we are one in spirit. In other words, the unity of the Trinity is understood as mutual self-giving and total sharing of life, love, and glory accomplished through the mutual dwelling of each person in the others. And this is used as a model within the ecumenical movement of church unity. And so Jesus is praying for the same among those who would follow him so that they may be bound together in a spiritual sense as well as being likewise bound to him that they may continue to live out his life in the world. Later in the prayer, Jesus speaks to the reason this oneness is so important, saying that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus' message of love loses its validity if the world cannot see that love in his followers. God has shown his love for us despite our problematic character, but that becomes less apparent to those outside of the church if we do not embody that love ourselves. Now there have been many different reasons for the dissolution of the church's unity. Social, cultural, economic, etc. And certainly doctrinal differences have often taken center stage. The problem is that rather than seeing doctrine as a tool for navigating our way through the mystery of God, we use it as a bludgeon against those who see differently. Pope John XXIII once pointed out that the deposit of faith 
meaning our systems of belief, is one thing. The way it is expressed is another. The church demonstrates the validity of its teaching, not by condemnation or severity, but with the medicine of mercy. Again, if we present ourselves to the world in a loveless way, our message falls flat on deaf ears. There's a word in Biblical Greek that is used numerous times in the New Testament and many times in the modern ecumenical movement. The word is koinonia, and it means fellowship. The term is often used in reference to those times we join together, particularly outside of worship. The coffee hour becomes a time of fellowship. But it goes much deeper than that. Not unlike Tolkien's Fellowship of the Ring, which refers to a people bound together by a common mission and a shared law. Also, like Tolkien's Fellowship, it is made up of a diversity of those from backgrounds that often serve as barriers between people. Within the Fellowship of the Body of Christ, all such differences fall away. We also recognize that the fellowship extends far beyond our particular confines and our particular expression of the deposit of faith, because it also includes those referred to as Creator, Redeemer, and Holy Spirit. And this should also remind us in our current situation that true oneness is more a matter of the heart than it is a matter of physical proximity. Let us pray. Loving and merciful God, we thank you for this opportunity to bear witness to you through word and music, even as our congregation is scattered beyond these walls. We thank you that in this time of separation, you help us to maintain our sense of oneness and maintain us as a fellowship grounded in faith and bound in love. We pray for your holy church here and around the world and ask that you help us tear down the walls that have separated us for so long. Teach us how we can truly be one, just as you are one with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Likewise, help us to seek unity within all with your creation, binding wounds and overcoming the religious intolerance that causes so much pain and division in this world. Help us to gather together a fellowship that embraces the whole of humanity. Amen. Thank you.